Like, what do they know that the rest of us don't? Founders Fund is obviously a great defense tech investor, but they've also done a ton in financial technology. We merge those two teams essentially, and that's where the next business like came out of. John, good to see you again. Um, back in the day, the first thing I, the first time I heard about you was through the video that you have done about Silicon Valley. That was a fantastic video. It made me actually get the book at the end and read it as well. But it gave me a fantastic landscape about the history of the VC. Uh, in the community in San Francisco. It was really, really helpful to understand how to raise funds and the, the, the happenings behind the scenes and all of that. But having said that, what got you into videos? How did you start doing videos? Yeah, I got into video during the pandemic lockdown. Um, I'd been an entrepreneur for about a decade across two companies. And for the first time in 10 years, I had free time, basically, because there was nothing going on on the weekends. Uh, there weren't any VC happy hours, no real social engagements, no friends and family stuff. So I had free time. So I'd basically just um, sit down on Sunday morning and think of an idea that I wanted to talk about. I would do some research write for a few hours, then record, which took 30 minutes. And then I'd edit for another couple hours and I would just put it up on YouTube. And it was really, really small, um, about a hundred views a video for maybe the first year, but I did everything myself from the writing to the recording to the editing. And uh, I got to tinker around in motion graphics and after effects a lot. And a lot of times I would just make videos for, for friends of mine who had questions. Like one of my friends was raising money for a new startup and I made him like a six video series on how to raise money. Um, and so it was just a very fun way to kind of, you know, get in the habit of working through an idea from start to finish and really creating a thesis and trying to hone things down and also just synthesizing everything that I'd learned and everything that I'd read. And that Silicon Valley history uh, video was a good example of kind of where everything came together from, you know, books that I'd read along with, um, you know, people that I'd talked to and was able to just really, really concisely explain the long-term history of Silicon Valley, which is something that I don't think a lot of people get when they watch, you know, the HBO show or, you know, read a TechCrunch article like this goes back decades and decades and decades. Silicon Valley is really it's like a rainforest. Uh, it's one of the metaphors that I've heard before is is that it's not just that there's a lot of VCs there or a lot of startups there. It's that there's also Stanford and Cal and this education system. And there's also military and government investment from decades ago. And all of these different things came together to kind of work in perfect harmony. And that's why, I mean, I think the the latest numbers were just in Q1 of 2023, I think almost $25 billion was invested into the, the Bay Area. Um, and New York was basically a distant second with like maybe 4 billion and LA was like 2 billion. So Silicon Valley is just in a completely different category and has been for a very long time because of the history and because of just this this confluence of factors, just every different moving part came together kind of perfectly in the 50s, 60s, 70s to create, I mean, the original reason why we call it Silicon Valley is because that's where they were making silicon chips, semiconductors. Now all the semiconductors are made in Taiwan and we just do software, but um, you know, a lot of the design and a lot of the a lot of the promising new technology companies are still built in Silicon Valley. So it was very interesting to dive into that and give a bit of a bigger perspective. And that was something that I thought was kind of missing from, from YouTube in general. I really wanted to find kind of a white space. There were a lot of people that were talking about the trendy news of the day and the stuff that gets the most clicks is always the most negative. So FTX, bankruptcy, SVB, uh, you know, Theranos, WeWork, all these negative stories were what people were focused on if they were, if they were talking about Silicon Valley at all. Um, I wanted to go back and talk about not only just the successes and, um, but also some of the, some of the deeper history that was kind of missing. And, and then I wanted to highlight some of my friends who were doing cool startups and just building interesting things. So a lot of the, a lot of the videos that I've done that have done really well have been, I'm kind of the only person on YouTube that's made a video about this particular topic. It's not being covered by anyone else. And, and, and that was, that was really key. Um, early on, I learned that it was very, very hard to compete on 
you know, making videos about Tesla because there's a ton of Tesla bulls that make videos all the time about the stock price and all this stuff. And it, of course, it's it's often poorly informed, but it doesn't matter because there's already so much content there. But when you look at, you know, a company like uh, Flexport or Varda or Cover or uh, Bolt, Marcus Villig's company that's ride sharing in Europe, um, all those videos have gotten a ton of views because no one else is really talking about them on YouTube. They're only talking about the big national news stories. How do you find these topics then? A lot of it's just my network and friends. Um, uh, a lot of it is just, you know, people that I'm close with, founders that I know either from Y Combinator or through Twitter. Um, there's a lot of times just being on the inside of, of the tech industry, you'll know the stories that are interesting. And there, there were a lot of times when I, I remember distinctly when Varda launched, uh, Delian had, had was, you know, had a big following on Twitter. There were a lot of threads. It was a very bold idea to manufacture things in space. It's a really crazy company, he raised a bunch of money for it. They're going to build these factories in space. It's, it's audacious. And instantly it became a whole cycle on Twitter. And there were a lot of threads explaining how it works. And people were actually exhausted on Twitter of hearing about Varda because everyone had talked about it so much. I remember uh, one of my friends was like, we don't need any more threads about Varda. We all know about it at this point. But on Twitter, no one had heard or on YouTube, no one had heard about it. No one knew what this company was. So uh, making just bringing that that topic to a different audience was valuable and everyone who watched the video on YouTube was like, oh, I've never heard of this company. I had no idea this was happening. And that's kind of the the continue the continuous story on YouTube is that it's just a very different audience, much more broad, um, much less, um, you know, tech insiders. They, they read a lot of newsletters. They definitely on Twitter and they also listen to podcasts, you know, like the All In podcast, um, you know, Logan Bartlett show, Andreessen Horowitz stuff. But there were very few people that were doing YouTube. Gary Tan was basically the only one. Um, and his stuff is great. And now he's merged with YC and they're doing cool stuff. Um, but, you know, he was taking he was very much doing vlogs and these very chill. Like he explains, like, you know, the fundamentals of entrepreneurship uh, It was great, great content. So I wanted to stand out from that and not look like a copycat also because he just has like much, much crazier stories than I do to share. Um, and so. And so like kind of the historical video essay, the full story of these important companies was something that he wasn't doing. He was doing a lot of interviews and a lot of stories from a lot of personal stories and a lot of wisdom about how to build companies. And I was focused on just a, a very, very different type of storytelling so that it didn't look like we were kind of stepping on each other's toes. And then we were actually able to collaborate and do a crossover episode, which was really fun. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's been really cool to yeah, just see it grow. Does this, uh, I saw so many people sharing your videos over time, especially in Twitter. You, you mentioned Gary Tan. It's like, I saw him uh, sharing a lot of videos as well. But does this, do you do any specific uh, that to get all that viewership? Or at, at this point in time, basically, it became established. People know you. Did, did you use any growth hacks at the beginning or anything like this? Or was it that it was fantastic content that people really needed to see? Uh, and there was information asymmetry from Twitter and, and that moved to, to YouTube? No, uh, Twitter was useless. Um, uh, Twitter, uh, pe people are upset about Twitter, uh, you know, blocking Substack links and whatnot. But uh, Twitter has never been a driver of YouTube views um, mm -hmm. for a few reasons. I mean, going back years, way before the Elon stuff, um, Twitter had always nuked links that deprioritized links in the algorithm that would take you off the platform. And that makes sense. That's the same thing with LinkedIn and, and, and Instagram, all, all of these platforms. They don't want you to leave the app because once you leave and you go to a different app, then you're not using their app. You're not seeing their ads. So uh, that was always the case. But even, even if they didn't, no one wants to click on a tweet that they're there kind of scrolling casually while they're waiting in line at a restaurant to get a sandwich or something and then watch a 20 minute, you know, YouTube video about some topic that's super deep and has music and, and, you know, voiceover and graphics. Like you need to be much more engaged. It's a completely different frame of mind watching a YouTube video versus uh, engaging with a tweet. Um, Substack makes sense because you're, you're already reading on Twitter. You click a link, you open it up. Maybe you read the, you know, a, a bit of an article or the whole Substack article. So that, that flow kind of worked, but YouTube never drove 
uh, drove uh, or Twitter never drove YouTube views. And I only had about a thousand followers on Twitter when I started YouTube. And I quickly eclipsed that on, 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 on YouTube. Um, all the growth came from going viral in the YouTube algorithm specifically. And that was a combination of, of high retention, people watching the videos all the way through and high click through rates. So figuring out how to package the videos in a very broad way. And this took a very, very long time. So I'll, 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 use, the, I'll use the Varda example. So Varda was a really cool company and cool story to talk about, but no one knew what Varda was. So if you say, you know, breakdown of Varda, no one's going to click that because they don't know what Varda is. Now, Delian had a little bit of a bigger audience on Twitter, but he didn't have a big audience on YouTube. So there were actually a couple of people that did interview with Delian about Varda. And that didn't really get a lot of viral clicks because he's not like a household name yet, although he probably will be soon. Um, but the, so, so, so framing it in the broadest sense, like, you know, this is the future of space manufacturing, something like that is something that anyone can grab onto. And so figuring out how to, how to frame these stories in really, really broad contexts. Like for, for Bolt, I was talking about Marcus Villig, the guy who built uh, kind of the ride sharing company in Europe. The title is just Europe's Youngest Billionaire because everyone knows Europe, everyone knows young, everyone knows billionaire. It's an interesting hook. We don't even talk about the company's name really in the title because not as many people know about it. The, the, the logo is in the thumbnail, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's very broad and accessible. So anyone can click on that. And then once they're in the video, they, they, they can say, okay, I actually want to know this person's story. I want to know how they, how they did it. Mm -hmm. um, so just figuring that out and figuring out how to appeal to a broad audience on YouTube was what led to the growth. And, and you can tell very quickly when something starts going viral, like you'll have, if you have, you know, a thousand subscribers, which I think I did for like the first year, um, you'll get about 10% of those people to show up to kind of have any video you put out. So you might get a hundred views, but then all of a sudden, if something clicks, I remember the first time I had a video about SpaceX go viral and it got 60,000 views. And it was just insane. Like the curve just goes directly up into the right and just grows exponentially. Um, and so when you, when you hit something in the, in the algorithm, it's very, very clear. And then you, have, you just have to figure out how to um, continue with those formats that work. And that's why you see the big YouTubers, they always use kind of the same formats. Um, you know, Mr. Beast will, be, will say, like, you know, I, I gave, you know, a million dollars to, you know, someone I gave, I, 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 you know, I, I challenged this person to do this. Uh, and, and every YouTuber kind of goes in these cycles where they find specific, specific titles and thumbnails, combinations that work, and then they double down on what works and they do a lot of content around there. It can get a little stale after a while if you're doing 20 videos about the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. But, but once you find uh, kind of a pattern that works, um, cashing in on that is really, really valuable. So one is the title to get people to actually click on it, but th then how do you get them to stay? Is it, I've seen you, you make the videos much shorter, you have a lot of, uh, you remove all the poses and all that, but do you have something specific there to keep the Yeah, there's a couple things. Um, the, so there's a bunch of interesting strategies. I think the biggest thing is in the title, you need to have, you need to tell the entire story in the title. So uh, the, the best example that, I've, that I have is I was talking about, I wanted to make a video about Microsoft acquiring Activision and how that had an impact on Facebook's attempt to build the metaverse. Because um, even though Zuck had been talking about the metaverse the most, Microsoft had a ton of gaming assets and could potentially they own Minecraft, so they, they potentially own a lot of the intellectual property and potentially some of the games that could un, like undergird the, the development of the metaverse. And of course, they had augmented reality glasses as well and a couple other projects they were working on. So the, so the, the, the way to kind of inject drama in a story was, uh, I used the title, Microsoft Just Killed Zuck's Metaverse. And so that's very, like, very dramatic. There's a clear protagonist and antagonist. People ve feel very strongly about Microsoft. Some people hate Microsoft and they, and they love PlayStation. Some people uh, love Facebook or hate Facebook. Um, so, so layering in that drama and telling you the entire story and the entire core conflict in just five words was really, really key. And, and using really, really broad terms. Um, like, I didn't use, you know, uh, Satya Nadella. 
because he's not as much of a household name as as Microsoft is. But, and I actually use Bill Gates in the thumbnail, even though he's not actively running the company, but he's more recognizable as a face. And then in terms of Facebook, it was confusing because it was Facebook and Meta at the time. So just saying Zuck is more is more broad because everyone knows who he is, even though there was some confusion over, oh, if you use the word meta, are you talking about the metaverse broadly? Or are you talking about that specific company? And then if you talk about Facebook, are you talking about the website Facebook or the app or like the whole company? So that was a little bit more confusing. So finding finding a term that anyone could understand is, is really, really key there. And then once you're in the video, it's really important to keep people watching. And so you, you you try and do things like tease what will happen. So with that video, you know, I kind of tell it in three parts and I tell you up front, like there are three key strategies that Microsoft's employing to build their version of the metaverse. And we're going to go through them one at a time, but I don't tell you what they are. So you need to kind of stay to the end to hear the full story. Mm. If we go back to uh, Silicon Valley that you mentioned earlier, was your first the, the first company you started that you went through Y Combinator? Yeah, the first company that I started went through Imagine K12, which later became part of Y Combinator. You had Jeff actually and had team? yeah, Jeff Ralston and Tim Brady, nice. um, and so it had some overlap with the YC partners, and it was structured the exact same as YC. But and PG came and did a talk, Paul Graham, and um, and, and it was it was very similar, but um, you know technically separate. But we were living. My team was living with a YC team out of an Airbnb, essentially. And so once Demo Day happened and both companies kind of didn't raise money and the products weren't really working, we merged those two teams, essentially. And that's where the next business like came out of. Mm. And what, what what's the business in YC? In YC, uh, well, we were doing one company that was education technology. So we were basically building like a quiz app to help you like practice flashcards on a mobile phone competitively with, um, you know, a friend. Um, and that was a good experience. Learned a lot about programming and getting apps in the app store, but really never figured out a customer acquisition loop. Couldn't really grow. And it was just, it was just very, very early. We only had three months to build it. And it was very, it was very rough around the edges. No, no employees. I was just building myself. And then the other company was doing wireless networking, um, kind of a precursor to the Helium network, but without the crypto side. So the idea was basically build out a bunch of wireless access points across people's houses, basically anyone that wanted to put one up, they could share their bandwidth and then anyone could connect to this kind of pirate radio network. It was very unclear what the business model would be. Um, it was kind of just like a bunch of electrical engineers who enjoyed tinkering with um, you know, wi wireless networking. Uh, at the time, the TV had just gone off the, like TV over the airwaves had been eliminated. So uh, there was like open bandwidth in a different band, um, kind of like the 5G era when all of this was happening. So there, there, there were some questions about, you know, would there be an opportunity there? Uh, it was completely like it was it was just total moonshot. It would have taken, you know, billions of dollars to probably win that. Um, so that couldn't really raise any money. And then and then we once and then once that had kind of failed to raise money, we started pivoting and testing out different ideas. We built a ton of different things like we built a. Uh, a precursor to Google Stadia, where you could play video games on a server and stream it to you. We also um, we also built a uh, like a, a tool for annotating classical music and sheet music. We built a T-shirt website. We were just building tons and tons of different stuff. We we built something that was actually pretty cool and like would have would have worked really well if GPT-4 <laughs> existed, but it was something that could help brands manage their social media accounts. So it would kind of like, like if, if you, let's say you're running like, you know, like a fitness company, it could take all the, all the new fitness news on the internet and feed it to you and kind of, and kind of highlight what interesting links would be able to share interesting topics that you could talk about and kind of help you with like content production. Um, but uh, again, it was like super early. Natural language generation was really, really bad. You could basically just like summarize an article. You could take in a take in a, a bunch of text from an article and and kind of pick which sentence might be in, most interesting based on how relevant it was to the other keywords. Like very, very simple algorithms. Um, but that was a lot of fun to build and kind of get out. It was like my first interaction with machine learning. We were using scikit-learn and like very, very basic Bayesian algorithms. Um, 
but it was a lot of fun to develop it and like actually build it, but it never really went anywhere. We never got anyone using it. it the product was not, not there. Um, but, you know, probably too early, kind of unclear. A, a lot of those ideas were a little bit like too early. Um, like there's even a company that does the virtual desktop stuff now called paper space. That's really successful, I think. And uh, obviously the, Microsoft cloud gaming is, is, is huge now. So um, there's th th there was a way, it just we weren't the right team or it wasn't the right time for us to really make it work. So, hmm. How did you start with uh, with Soylent? Like how, how did you get the idea and how did you guys approach it? Yeah, it was very simple. I mean, we were running out of money. We had, I think like, I don't know, $50,000 in the bank. We paid our, our um, rent a year in advance. We owned our laptops. We paid for internet. And we really had no expenses other than food. Um, and we realized that in San Francisco, you're kind of caught between a couple bad trade-offs. You can eat fast food, which is unhealthy, but it's cheap and easy. You can try and grow your own food, which would be the healthiest, but super time intensive, but it is cheap. But that's not really an option when you're living in an apartment in San Francisco. Or you can try and go out and dine at like a nice restaurant, but that's really expensive even though it's not time consuming. Um, so Soylent was kind of designed to kind of break that. It was like, hey, let's let's order all these like powders online and it will be something that's like meets our base nutritional needs. It's healthy, it's cheap, and it's super convenient. Of course, you're sacrificing on like taste and experience, but that was something that we were willing to sacrifice on because we just wanted to work and program basically. So, um, and then as soon as Rob came up with the formulation, our CEO, the co-founder, um, and, and started talking about it online, everyone was interested and we had like 10,000 signups in a day. It was like very, very clear that this was like going mega viral and like we should focus on this 100% of the time and we should skip everything else because this was- Why was it going uh, viral though? Did you, did a lot of people in uh, SF know about it? Did you speak to people? Like, did you use any strategies for that? How, yeah, it was how mostly Hacker remember? News. Rob wrote some really, really great viral blog posts that did really mm -hmm. well on Hacker News. And then that, that got the attention. It was like very weird techie guy who quit eating food, super, super viral clickbait essentially. And so Vice News started writing about it, Discovery. We were in the we were on the cover of the New Yorker. Rob went on the Colbert Report. It was like really, really big. Um, and basically it came down to like an age old marketing tactic. We didn't know this at the time, but uh, Ogilvy, one of the fathers of modern marketing, uh, had this theory that if you're trying to sell, like you need to do a stress test if you're trying to sell something new. So his idea was if you're trying to sell glue, glue is a very boring product. It doesn't look attractive. It's not like a car, but it's not fun to look at. And everyone wants to know, is this glue strong? So really the way to do it is to show them a stress test. So he had this campaign for this French glue company where he took the spokesperson and he put glue on the bottom of the spokesperson's shoes and then glued them to the ceiling. And so it's a very high stakes scenario. If the glue doesn't work, the spokesman is going to fall and break their neck. And so you can't look away because it's this daring feat of, you know, high risk and it's very intense. And so at the time, so you you can't look away. You're watching this person who might fall at any minute and they don't proving that the glue works. And while that's happening, they're they're giving you the pitch on why you should buy this particular glue and so the soylent experiment was kind of the same thing where it was like sure you might not trust this weird techie to make this new food but he lived on it for 30 days he didn't have any problems he says he got healthier i'll give it a try if this person can live on it for 30 days straight maybe i can try it for one meal and, and, and that proved to work wow and then how did you source? Like, where did you source from uh, in the beginning? You mean in terms of like manufacturing? Yeah. Um, we, we, we networked and called some friends and found a manufacturer who could handle, uh, it's called Copacker. Co um, and it, there were some problems at the beginning because we, we, we had a crowdfunding website and we'd, we'd put up our pricing and we'd, we'd raised, I think, almost $3 million for the first shipment. And so when we went to the co-packer, they knew what we wanted to charge and they would basically try and extract us for the maximum amount of money that we had. Um, so it was a very, very tough negotiation. We had to eventually move to a different co-packer. Um, 
uh, but making making direct to consumer products, like making these products, is not difficult. There's plenty of many. It's part of the problem of why why it's hard to build a business in that space is because it's pretty easy to actually get set up and build something with your own brand on it. It happens all the time. You see people launch all sorts of different products, and it's always just because oh, there's a manufacturer out there that can make it, you know, for cheap and you know do a small run. So yeah, but it actually when I was in uh, Cyprus, I was hearing about Soylent all the times. Yeah. So basically, you 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 reached audience in the other side of the world. Uh, and, the yeah, and and then uh, also Soylent grew to be quite big as well. How were you thinking at the times? Like you, you raised a lot of funds as well. What did what what got you to the finish line as well? Was it that um, you're thinking there is a limit to Soylent, or how were you thinking at the end? Yeah, I mean, at, at the time, I mean, in the early stage, we were just thinking like, oh my god, something's working. Thank God, like. <laughs> um, it, this is like so much better than just launching product after product that just fails and gets 50 users and is terrible. Uh, we actually have something that people want to buy. That's great. Let's just keep doing that as long as possible. Then, you know, um, the, the the fundraising was really about like, okay, let's let, let's take on the larger food manufacturers. Let's go after, you know, Nestle. Let's try and build a really, really big business here. Obviously, that's very, very hard to do in direct-to-consumer. Um, and it didn't really pan out the way we wanted it to. Is it, it was very hard to come up with, like, second acts. And part of that's just because, uh, you know, food products are very, are very driven by um, cultural factors and trends and fads. And so, you know, people, people come in, they try a diet for a while and then they move on to the next thing and the trends move on. And what was popular at the time, you know, like keto and paleo and veganism, like that might not be popular in a few years. And then there's new companies that come in and, and focus on a different, uh, a different thing. This is the same thing happened with, uh, the artificial meats, the, the, uh, all, all, all those like plant-based burger companies, plant-based stuff. A lot of those companies, they're now like facing backlash because of their ingredients and people aren't into them as much as they were anymore. So um, yeah, th these are all very driven by like these big, like, you know, hype cycles where they become memes and everyone consumes them. And then after a while, people kind of move on to the next thing. So it, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, it's very tricky to become like an enduring brand. Um, it's, it's a very delicate balance. Yeah, be, being into the space, I've seen uh, it. It's always a cycle. It goes from um, when I was younger, it was like high protein, low carbohydrates. Then it became ketogenic. Then it became fasting. Then it became something else. It's like it's changing every year. So if you are a brand, it uh, it seems very difficult to build something there. That's that's very interesting. And then what did you do afterwards? Like uh, how did you came up with the idea of Lucy? Yeah, so um, it had been a few years at Soylent, and we wanted to uh, do something different, and we wanted to focus on something that that had maybe some, maybe more of a moat. Um, and we noticed that Nicorette had been on the market for 40, 50 years to help people quit smoking. It's a nicotine gum, and modern consumers weren't really using it. Um, and so we, we we thought there'd be a better way. So we built this this company, Lucy, that. Um, was designed to be a you know better nicotine gum essentially. So uh, it's regulated differently. It's uh, it's packaged differently. It's sold directly to the consumer. Um, but also it's in a it's in a FDA lane that requires a lot of upfront investment in regulatory, and that creates a little bit of a moat. It's very very hard to start one of these companies. We couldn't have done it unless we had the first company under our belt. Um, but once we did, we were able to work through all of the applications, work with the FDA and um, work towards approval, um, which was uh, a lot of work, but, um, you know, obviously pays dividends. What, uh, what, what was different in your approach when you started, uh, Lucy, in terms of after learning so many things in business, like what did you do differently? Yeah, I think, um, I think we... We kind of shied away from the the, the going broad and viral marketing because, um, like, Juul had already kind of gone viral in the tobacco nicotine space, and it, they just wound up attracting a bunch of kids, which was very detrimental to their business in the long term. It was very good for a while, and then it wound up being very bad. <laughs> and we didn't want to get kids to use this. We really wanted to focus on that older millennial consumer who maybe had already smoked or vaped and, and then was looking to you know, move to something different. Um, and so we were much more targeted um, on like Facebook, Instagram and podcasts, really trying to 
get it just into the right people's hands, which is very, very tricky. It's very hard to have a product that you you want to you want to grow, but you don't want to grow at all costs because that'll have backlash and it'll have a bad outcome. You don't want to you don't you don't want your product to to just become a total meme that everyone's using because then kids will use it, obviously. So it was it was it was a very delicate delicate balance. Um, and then other than that, I mean, we were definitely sharper on the manufacturing side, made less mistakes there, made less mistakes on, on in, in a lot of different ways, just like much, much higher focus on, you know, quality and, and um, keeping things in stock and just, just, just doing best practices from day one. Mm. And in terms of the team uh, that you build, what learnings do you have over time? Like, what what traits are you looking in people when they're joining uh and what what can other entrepreneurs learn from you here yeah um i mean we we, we kept a lot of the same team uh i think four of the core people at soylent came over to lucy um and then uh and, and that was kind of like our first four people basically um and then as we grew you know we were definitely hiring for you know, flexibility because we knew that there was going to be a kind of a pivot point where we'd move from direct to consumer to retail. So having having the ability to to you know actually change how the business works over time and be flexible in that regard was important. Um, we we're also just focused on people who are really really good at leveraging existing tools. Um, like e-commerce has come really far. You don't need to build all that much. So just focusing on you know finding someone who's a generalist software developer who can use Shopify and use the existing tools to kind of get them get the most value out of these things instead of rebuilding everything from scratch really so the, uh, there was a whole trend in like 2012 2013 where a lot of these direct to consumer companies would build you know huge systems um, all by themselves like Dollar Shave Club and, and Birchbox all these companies had built like kind of their own e-commerce stacks and it was it were just really really difficult and basically unnecessary, especially now that Shopify is so good. Uh, it's really, really unnecessary. So we, we, we really tried to lean into, the, you know, the existing platforms and keep the, keep the company lean. And even today, I think we're, you know, under 10 people. It's pretty small. And then you recently joined Founders Fund as well. Yeah. Um, how did this come about? Did you reach out to the folks at Founders Fund? Did they reach out to you? How did this start? Yeah. Um, I was, I, 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 done a podcast with them and I'd spoken at one of their conferences and was just kind of generally friendly with a bunch of people at the firm. We'd pitched Peter in the past and we pitched the team there in the past and kind of knew some folks over there. Never, never got aligned on an investment, but was always kind of a friend of the fund. And then um, they were looking to um, kind of do some interesting new things with video and I built up this YouTube channel. And so it seemed like a fit. So they reached out to kind of, um, you know, chat about, you know, what doing something on video would look like and um, coming on as a entrepreneur in residence seemed like a good fit um, where I could kind of come in, build a YouTube channel, focus on, you know, covering their companies, but just generally be, you know, a, an asset to the brand team broadly. And, uh, Yeah, it's been really fun. It's only been a couple months, but um, been very focused on the work that they've done in defense specifically, because even though I don't know all that much about it, it's really fun to, to learn about it. And they've been investing in defense technology for decades now. Like Palantir was a huge, huge success that no one really talks about in the venture space. But, you know, Founders Fund was they incubated that company essentially and it's you know a publicly traded multi-billion dollar company and then spacex obviously was you know they don't people don't think about it as a defense company and it, it's not but they sell to the government a lot and they put a lot of satellites in space and founders fund was basically the first institutional money into the company and and then they're doing it again with anderol where you know it was incubated by trey stevens at founders fund and the company's grown a ton and now they're doing uh, a ton of work with the government and so There's there's this interesting arc where Founders Fund is been for decades like really one of the best defense government technology partners, um, but it's completely under discussed. Like no one really puts two and two together, and so um, I thought it'd be a really interesting opportunity to kind of tell that story on on YouTube and try and highlight some of the stuff that they've done because it's it's really impressive. I think it's really important work. Uh, still haven't figured out exactly how to tell that story fully. Um, 
it's definitely like a, a, a big branding project, but uh, it's been fun making videos about Anderol and kind of getting to know the team there and understand how they think through things. It's a really fascinating company. Mm. In the first, you mentioned that you pitched Peter Thiel in the past. In the pitch that you've done, what do you remember? How, how did he approach it? And um, what do you remember from that? Yeah, I mean, it was a great, great conversation. He's... Uh, He's just very, very good at understanding business. I mean, people get caught up in all the all the different like you know, philosophy and politics and all sorts of stuff. But at the end of the day, he's just a brilliant business mind, and he very, very quickly understood our business and what we should do. And he gave us some very good advice, and uh, and then we didn't take it, and you know, because we listened to other VCs, and and, and it was the wrong thing to do. So I was always left with this uh, this this you know, thing in the back of my mind, like, oh, wow, like, uh, I should have, like, we should have listened to Peter. Um, and so he's always been someone that I've looked to as, uh, as just a, a really thoughtful individual in the business community and someone who really, really understands entrepreneurship and building big businesses. And so, uh, I, and I think that, I think the biggest thing is like, you know, a lot of Peter's thesis is around defensibility and moat building. And there's a few ways to do that, you know, intellectual property, brand building. Those are very difficult from the venture capital mindset. Um, more often you see network effects or economies of scale. And so, um, you know, just being really realistic with like, does your company have that or is, are you building towards that? Um, and that's kind of the story of, uh, you know, like SpaceX, like SpaceX doesn't have a network effect or they don't really have a brand. Like if you need to put a satellite in space, you're not going to pay more for a SpaceX rocket just because it's cool. It's not like a, like a Bugatti or a Ferrari or something, you know, you're going to do it because it's cheap and they've figured out how to do it most efficiently. And they've just created, you know, incredible economies of scale. So being really realistic with yourself and your company about, okay, am I building towards something like that? That informs the financing strategy, in my opinion. Like you shouldn't, shouldn't raise a ton of money and go super big unless you actually have a, a thesis around how you'll capture a disproportionate amount of value in the market. Mm. But also you raise from some of the best investors in the world in the past. Uh, if, T if Peter Thiel told you uh, something nobody else told you, I'm, I'm wondering where does this come from? Like, is this from his experience? Is this from what is like from, from your interactions with him? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think he's, he's an incredible entrepreneur, PayPal, Palantir, bunch of other companies he's also built big organizations like founders fund is at the end of the day a company that he built and it's wildly successful um even though it's a even though it's a venture fund um and and then i i, I just think he's very very diligent about in thinking independently and he just really really avoids herd mentalities and a lot of that goes back to his time at stanford and working with renee girard the philosopher who talks about mimesis and mimetic desire and how how uh, you know, humans tend to like think in these patterns and groups. And so um, he's just very, very, he's very good at just putting all of that noise aside and just making up his own conclusions. And then, yeah, he's just seen everything in business. He's seen so many companies, he's probably invested in, I don't know, a thousand companies or something. So he's seen everything. But yeah, um, the, yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it's a little, I think, yeah, he's just really, really, really experienced and really diligent about maintaining independence in terms of how he thinks through things. I was actually looking for videos of René Girard and I don't think you can find many online. Maybe this could be uh, another... Yeah. Oh, René Girard? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. he's done a couple interviews, um, but he was kind of in the pre-video era. There's a good class on Girardian thought by, I think, a guy named David Perel and Jonathan Bai, B I, I think. Um, mm. They did a whole course on it that's... I haven't looked at it yet, but I'm... Mm. What videos do you think you're going to do now from now onwards uh, for Founders Fund? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm working on a big video about Anderol where I interviewed a whole a whole bunch of the team members. That's really that's really been fun and interesting to work on. But I want to move maybe a little bit quicker and cover, you know, a broader swath of companies. I've been focused on basically Anderol and defense technology for a few months. And I, and mm. I think it might be more fun to have a little bit faster pace because Founders Fund has done a bunch of interesting, bunch of interesting investments in all sorts of companies. And I, I just really enjoy telling the story of a company from start to finish, even if it's some obscure company that no one's heard of. That's just kind of where I, where I find, uh, what I find the most interesting. And so I, I think I'd like to, you know, 
pick up the pace and talk more about a broader set of topics, broader set of companies. Um, Founders Fund is obviously a great defense tech investor, but they've also done a ton in financial technology, um, you know, PayPal and then Stripe and then Ramp. So they've, you know, had this like series of really, really big wins in in fintech. They're also, I think they're like early investors in Mint or something like there's uh, Credit Karma. There are a bunch of these companies that have, have been in the portfolio and, and it's it's a little bit less exciting to talk about just because like rockets are cool and, and you know, AI defense is cool. But um, it is very interesting that they really know what they're doing in terms of uh, in terms of fintech. And, and that's a lot of the DNA of the firm. So I think that'd be interesting to talk about. And then obviously there's a big energy thesis going on in Silicon Valley right now. This has been going on for a very long time, but um, but people are starting to look at energy more seriously. Um, so Workrise is a oil and gas company. And then there's a bunch of nuclear companies that are doing interesting things right now. Um, some founders funds working with, some aren't. But in general, there's just a very, very interesting uh, turning point with nuclear right now that, that I think would be interesting to focus on. Yeah. What's your process when, when you go after these companies? Like you, you choose a portfolio company, let's say, and then what do you do? Like what do you... What do people find interesting and what's your approach? Like, do you go and meet the founders and you learn the story or how do you do it? Yeah, I mean, sometimes I'll interview the founder. Um, that actually tends to slow down the process. I, I actually prefer to just go and look at their other podcast interviews and 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 build the video from scratch. Um but it, but it is valuable, especially if the founder hasn't been on a lot of podcasts to, to sit down with them and interview them. And it just adds a different layer of, you know, kind of intrigue to say, okay, this, you know, we, we actually went and got primary source material. It's very, very interesting when, when that can happen. It, it does take more time because um, you have to book it and do it, record it, and then review the script and see where the good parts are and all, all this stuff. It's, it, it's not, it's not super, it, it definitely adds a step to the production. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I still enjoy just going and and researching a company and just reading the, the the existing coverage and putting that together and that's also like the nicest thing to do for the for the founders time you know you don't you don't have to waste any of their time talking you're just like hey we just made this video um so yeah that's uh, that's one option um but yeah i mean with anderol i went and interviewed hmm. i i watch this um i watch a lot of videos in general when when it comes to for example when you go into the Tesla manufacturing plant and you go inside and you speak to people there and people see inside of it what's going on. That yeah. would be very interesting. It's like if you do that in Palantir, for example, and we see what's inside of Palantir or if you do in Andoril and we see what's inside of Andoril, it's be super, super interesting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I, I think that's, I, I think that is interesting. Um, you always got to be keep in mind, like how are you framing this for, you know, a broad audience? Like, um, but there's definitely a way to do it that, you know, finds a balance. Like it's it, it's good for the people who know the story, but it's also good for people who never heard of this and, and need to be, uh, you know, educated about it. Um, the 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 hard part is that if you use like if you use like very direct framing, you know, like the like like the story of Palantir, um, that is only really going to appeal to people who already know what Palantir is and are interested in. Um, Whereas it, it might be most valuable to explain what Palantir is to people who don't know what Palantir is, right? So then you have to find a different way to tell that story. Um, so finding like narrative val uh, like narrative violations or things that are counterintuitive is often very valuable. Um, like when I did a video about Cover, this company building homes, they're building like prefab backyard homes and in a factory. And, it, and prefab has been on the decline for the last like, 50, 60 years. Um, but all these VCs were investing in prefab home building. So why? <laughs> like, what do they know that the rest of us don't? And that's an interesting question to explore. Um, and so when, whenever you can find one of those interesting, you know, questions like, you know, oil and gas is clearly not the future. The future is solar and nuclear and all these new technologies. But, and yet like, this company, Workrise, works in oil and gas and is very successful. Like, why is that? Well, there's a bunch of reasons. Like oil and gas is going away, but it's not going away today. There's a whole, there's a whole industry that's going to continue for a very, very long time, even as the, even as the global economy, you know, decarbonizes. Um, and so uh, it's just a very interesting like narrative violation. And mm. 
that is usually something that piques people's interest and gets them interested in listening to the whole story. John, uh, as a last question, what should we expect from the future from you? Uh, are you going to start another business? Are you going to become a full-time investor? Or what's what, what what are you thinking? Yeah, I mean, part of joining Founders Fund was like, it's an opportunity to figure that out um, and see what I want to do. Um, I think I want to continue making great content, improve the production process, put out more content more regularly that always hits my quality bar. I'm doing longer videos now and they've kind of slowed down, but I want to get back on a weekly cadence, but with the longer, bigger videos. Um, and there's a lot of other low-hanging fruit in, in in content, um, whether it's like longer form stuff or shorter form stuff, there's a lot of different directions that you can take that. And then, yeah, it'd be interesting to start another business. I'm an entrepreneur at heart and I love building stuff. I, I just kind of want to, you know, make sure that I pick something that's, you know, a really great market and something that is a great fit for my skill set and my audience and everything that I've done all like, you know, comes together to really accelerate that. And then I do angel investing and I like that. Um, but I'm not really sure where that goes. I'm still kind of figuring that out. What do you usually invest in? Um, I mean, it's been a variety of things. Um, you know, a few years ago, it was software, enterprise software, AI tools. I was really, I was really excited about um, just content AI stuff. So I, I invested in a few companies that did that uh, that applied AI to very like niche um, content plays. Um, I've invested in some, it's basically just like whatever's in my network and like whoever, like if I meet an interesting founder and I like what they're doing and a lot of, a lot of founders are doing like software. So that's like what comes up most of the time. Um, but it's usually just like super early stage bets on just founders that I like. I, I don't have a fund and I'm not doing like series A's or anything. So it's basically just like, oh, a friend is starting a company. Like, you know, why not? support them. Fantastic. John, thanks for the chat. Yeah, this is great.